some of the work we've been doing on the uh, development of a crypto framework for GPK um, and part of the development team in, in Shannon. Um, so really when we kicked off this project, we, um, the scope um, of the, the work, we, we wanted to design a, a crypto framework that was going to work with the standard model that we use within DPK, the, the burst oriented APIs that accept envelopes. Um, we wanted a framework and, and a way of uh, actually uh, creating with crypto offloads that um, were going to be independent of the underlying PMD uh, implementation. So we, we wanted the same APIs to be usable from if you're going to be using something like the Intel Quick Assist uh, hardware underlying or if you're doing on-core, maybe using the, the other implementation that we have is uh, based on the ASNI multi-buffer library that's been developed by one of Intel's security um, teams. Um, we want also obviously to support um, chaining of crypto operations so you can use one uh, operation to get do both the cipher and hash transforms in a single request. And also we, we looked at adding both session-based and the sessionless crypto operations. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more further. Um, so, as I said, fundamentally it's a burst-oriented um, API, that, so it, and it looks like the, the main APIs were actually enqueuing data to a crypto device look very much like uh, an Ethered device, you've got a, instead of an RX and TX, you've got an NQ burst, so that's loading, uh, putting the work out to the crypto device to get uh, processed, and then asynchronously you can then call the DQ at the other side. Um, so. To, to achieve this, you're, again, you're passing in uh, the arrays of envelopes. So we've, I, I had to add a, a new uh, pointer to in, into the envelope um, to allow us to pass the crypto operation details. And then you just flag an offload flag that gets set in the envelope. So when you push a burst into a packet, you, each packet to get processed needs to have a, a valid crypto operation um, structure attached to the envelope. Um, so these are the basic crypto primitives, so if you've used OCF and BSD or uh, I suppose even if you're familiar with uh, using the QuickSys APIs as exist for the current hardware or even the, these, these are all the basic things that are quite similar even to ODP's crypto APIs, um, they're the basic def definitions of different cy cipher and authentication uh, algorithms and then the, the operations that you want to perform. Um, nothing too exciting about those. And then this is actually new, this has changed since the actual RFC that went onto the mailing list um, a few weeks, or probably well, about two months ago now. This is, uh, it's, it's to allow a greater um, flexibility in how we, when you're creating sessions or you're, when you want to actually describe what sort of crypto, uh, crypto transformations you want to be. Uh, Provided it, what we do is you can you create a chain of the crypto operations. So each X, where I call it a transform, crypto transform. So each transform has a pointer to the next one. So if it's possible for hardware device to possibly support three or four transforms in a single operation, you would have um, four transform structures defining the transform type. And then, so in this case, we only currently have obviously a cipher and a authentication transform type. So the normal operation would be you would have two transforms chained together. Um, and then I just, on the, the lower details here, I've just shown what the underlying uh, transforms for a cipher and a authentication would look like. So you're setting the operation, the algorithm, and then providing the key. So this, the, the, this is the structure that would be, if you're creating sessions, so if you want to, the, the standard way of um, doing crypto operations is for say a flow of, of, uh, of data, you're, you're going to have a standard crypt, uh, crypto operation, a standard definition of what you want to do to that flow. So it's the, the, the it's going to be the same encryption, same authentication um, uh, details for every packet in that flow. But for that immutable data, you don't want to be calculating, doing the cipher key expansions, and for the authentication, you're going to be doing the iPad um, and OPAD calculations for every time you're doing the packet. Obviously, the way it's done in, in all of the crypto frameworks that exists, you you do those upfront. Uh, you have that that information cached, 
and uh, then you attach that to your crypto operation. So the, 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 I've, uh, just a little bit later on, I'll show you the how visually how these things link together, but this is in general the immutable data. Um, so then we've got uh, the crypto session create, and the only so that that's passing a huge chain of transformations, and then you do that in a crypto ID. So the one the one current limitation uh, at the moment, if you're working with sessions, a session is created for the underlying device because if you if you want to create that in a, a, a the most um, the efficient way, you you have to use so if it's a PMD, it's a hardware PMD. You may have ending issues that you have to want to have them, the keys uh, in the correct ending this. So crypto sessions are currently, you can, you, if you have multiple devices of the same type, you can use that session created on any device with it, uh, with that, of that device type. But at the moment we're limited that if you create a session on for, with a software crypto to PMD, you can't use that on the hardware PMD because it's on, on it, it'll just it'll give you an unsupported crypto session failure at that point. So we're look, I'm looking at ways uh, as we proceed with this to uh, to make that more flexible that possibly that we'd be able to create um, if you <coughs> run into that um, situation that you may be able to create the first time you hit software if you both only had a session before you used in hardware that you would then create that so software cached uh, session and then you could use that from that point forward. Um, so and, and, and to to improve the efficiency of that, we we have um, session pools that that are managed within the crypto device framework, and they provide some hooks back to the actual implementation of PMD. So you can in, inside the PMD, if, if you want for, for things like cleaning up the keys after sessions finished, you can define exactly what elements of the uh, session you need you need to erase after the usage, um, and also, you can tell the framework the size of the amount of private data you require to handle all of your uh, key material. Um, so then, uh, just at the end of that, I'm just saying again, the sessions are, are linked to the, a particular type of crypto device. Um, so the, the crypto operation, this is the structure that gets uh, attached and then filled out. It's for on a packet per packet basis. So this is the, the mutable data that's changing uh, from data, from packet to packet. So you're offsets into the AMBUF and the, the length of the data and it also contains things like the pointers to IV digests and additional authentication data as they're required for the particular transform. So those, the, the, those parameters IV digest, they can be, could be pointed internally within the AMBUF. Um, more common if you're looking at something like IPsec and an ingress path or you could have those um, allocated in another location, the only limitation being if you're using a hardware device, those need to be in physically addressable space. Um, so, and then, yeah, so, the next slide here. So this is kind of just a di diagram showing how the it fits together. So you've got a, your standard M both with your payload and headroom. You may, if it's, you may have the IV data and digest coming in if you were doing um, in handling ingress traffic to might be IPsec. So you're going to attach, so I suppose that I guess in a use case such as IPsec, you're going to have done a look up on the, the IPs and, and your uh, your SPI, uh, et cetera. So you find your session, you match your session, and then you fill out the different parameters within the crypto op. So the crypto operation is describing, pointing to where the IV is in the digest and uh, it has the, off the, the offset cements. And then <coughs> you've also attached to that the, the pointer to the session, so that uh, this, that's the session data which is defining the, the key, has, which has the keys and, and defines the actual operation that's going to take place on, on the payload of the MBUF. Um, <coughs> so the, we, we've created operation pools, so they're very much in the same image as the packet MBUF pools. So, as you're going to be creating these, on a, going to use these on a packet per packet basis, we've got a pre-allocated pool up front uh, that you can pull from to just to speed uh, along uh, this, and then then um, just the standard API, these are the showing standard APIs that we have for uh, creating a pool and allocating operations from the pool, and then you can then free it up when you've finished processing in the crypto device. 
Um, the one thing to notice here, this is just relating to our session, um, we're going to start using the Sessionless API. We, I've got support here for, you can set a number of uh, X forms. So if, if you were doing a Sessionless based processing, this allows you to say, I'm going to have, I, I may want to use I want to use two uh, two transforms. Uh, I'm going to use two transforms in my sessions operation. So you, you don't have a pre-allocated session, and you just fill in those X forms, and they're 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 included in the crypto operation. Um, so that uh, means that you don't have to do all the malloking or memory for those um, as uh, as you go. Um, and so yeah, so this is the. So that there is actually then when you're using this is from this it will be from the same mempool but we use a, sec, a separate a sessionless uh, alloc function which then defines the number of transforms that it and it's just appended actually I'll show you in this diagram just I, I'm just showing here the gray on this, in the crypto app so if you were to want to use the sessionless a, APIs that you can they, they that memory would be allocated at the end of the crypto app structure so then you're just filling out the parameters there. Um, and so th then the, you then in each uh, transform you, you select the type of transform and the the next pointers will be already allocated will be set already be set up when you call the sessions API um, and then you the I suppose the one disadvantage of using the session is is when you actually submit the job to the device you need to do the expansion of the crypto keys um, in line with the actual operation and processing but it gives a certain level of flexibility if you're dealing with lots of once-off type traffic. Um, so implemented P PMDs that we've done, we've got two PMDs with the patch set that's on, currently the V1 that's on DPDK. If one's based around the SNI multi-buffer library that was developed by the Intel security team, um, and it takes advantage of the SNI instruction sets on core uh, that accelerate the AES encryption and decryption. Um, um, so the PMD is basically a lightweight buffer, buffer sorry, wrapper around the multi-buffer library. Um, it also makes uh, very strong use of the uh, vectorized instructions to further accelerate the, the processing. So as you find, if you, if you look at the, the, when it's processing, say using the AVX2 instruction, you're seeing that you're, con you're you, you get quite a scaling, good scaling um, across, the uh, across the processing and the uh, there's a very good white paper that details of all the information about the uh, multi-buffer library at this link and you can actually download, that's the download link then, just to the actual multi-buffer library, which is required to be downloaded and installed when you want to actually, if you want to use this PMD. The Quixis device is, a, is an Intel the DX 899X series that we've developed for, the, or Cleto Creek, that we're, that's the, this is the second PMD, and on that we've I've just highlighted it here in bold the elements of that device uh, supports symmetric, asymmetric, and data compression. But for this implementation, just the, the bold and out um, uh, algos are the ones that we're support, supporting. Um, and just the only other limitation, this, the way we use the Quick Assist, we, you, you still requires that you have the PF kernel driver installed. And you, what you do is get it to enable the SRIOB devices. And then you've got 32 virtual devices that can be used within DPDK. Um, so, performance-wise, uh, there's actually in, in the patch set there's two. There's a, a in the test app in DPK. There's two um, two tests that you can run, and the the basically you can run a Q8T or the multi-buffer PMD, and they'll give you some. They'll be, you'll be able to see the performance numbers for yourself on your particular platform. Um, this is just uh, showing. So the on the lower is the different is increasing packet size and the the throughput in gigabits per second. So I'm not allowed to give the numbers, but uh, the what you find is very it's very this is a very lightweight API um, because the performance team haven't looked at it this year. But if you look at the white paper, the blue tracks practically identically the performance that's laid out in the multi buffer white paper. There's there's little or no overhead. And the quickest if numbers pretty much matched exactly as expected in its documentation as well. So the, the, the actual library is very lightweight, but we haven't got to the official point where we can release numbers for um, um, future work. So, so we're, we're looking, 
possibly adding asymmetric crypto to the data path as well. That's we we haven't we've only started looking at that and we'd see really what the the community need for it is. And then the second point we started looking at is developing an IPsec stack based um, on the SD kernel implementation. So we've got a very basic prototype of that working. It's quite performance wise is poor enough at the moment. And we've got we've got a lot of ways we want to look at improving that and hopefully we'll be able to release that to the community in the coming months. So that's that's it. Sorry, that was a whistle to our tour. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So that's the second device API in DPDK, just after the ZBTH day one. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, one point in that I tried to reuse as much of the East Dev uh, infrastructure as possible without replicating it. There probably is work that could be looked at in the future that pulling out a, a core device type and making it more flexible, but wasn't really in the scope of what we were trying to do. So I yeah. think that's future work. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, so you chose to use the, the Ember for this API. You chose to extend it. Yeah. But given that the cache and size is limited, what will happen to MBUF when we, we we want to integrate new API, let's say for compression or video? Um, I suppose there's there, there's probably a number of things we could look at doing that. One would be uh, you're probably only going to be submitting a, if it's an offload uh, acceleration like crypto is. It, it's you, you could look at that making that a union and it's a single offload, or maybe we could have. There's, there's a number of ways of approaching it. I haven't thought too strongly about a particular implementation because it really depends on what the next type of device uh, offloads are and how, how we envisage they need that information needs to be passed through. Um, but do, do you think the MBUF uh, should be the structure used for every API? Um, it, it makes sense for pipelining. If yeah. the information is attached to the MBUF as opposed to creating a new encapsulation and using that as the to to, to the device. I, I think it, it does make sense and for something like crypto, which is a fairly computen computationally intensive task anyway, especially if you're doing it on core, the overhead this hidden second cache line is probably insignificant to what the processing you're going to be doing. If you're doing six hundred cycles of processing on, on a crypto operation, I, I'm not sure that it's going to make a performance, but obviously I don't have, we haven't tested that, so I can't commit to it. But, but this transformation or everything that you said is not only related to crypto, so it, it could be any transformation like compression. Um, so it will probably make sense to, to make this more generic and not. Yeah, we certainly, I think at the AMBOF uh, level, we could make a much more generic structure instead of having Having it specific for crypto, you could have a, that more, that slightly more of a generic offload, or absolutely maybe even go to the point where you're able to chain different offload types together, then use the, the transform, that's <coughs> the offload flags to dictate what types of offloads are available. That's certainly an option. And this this is the first one, and I, I didn't see the point of doing that without some understanding of the other types of offloads that we want to do. I think. As some when we look at what what they may be, it'll get much more clarity on to how we should do approach that. All right.